Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Women. On this show, you will learn how to create wealth through real estate the blissful way. That means with very little stress and very little time. We talk about strategies, mindset, heart set, money smarts, resources, and so much more to ensure you're able to create the success you most deeply desire. Now, here's your host, Monika Sawyer. Today, ladies, I am so excited to welcome to the show, Steve Kafagi. Isn't that the most amazing name, ladies? <laughs> I think I even got it right. <laughs> Anyways, yes. <laughs> Seif is an ex-techie turned real estate investor who has helped thousands diversify into real estate after spending nearly five years at Facebook. He's syndicated acquisitions totaling more than $100 million while designing and developing more than 25 properties. Today, he's the founder of TechVestor, which helps real estate investors and busy professionals passively invest in the emergent asset class of short-term rentals, aka Airbnbs. Hey there, Seif. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's amazing. Your energy is infectious. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. And I loved our conversation in the green room. I feel the same way about you. (laughs) Thank you. you. Very excited to be here. So thank you for having us. Yes, my pleasure. So talk to me a little bit about how did you come up with this idea of TechVestor, right? You go from tech. So I'm from the Silicon Valley. I now live in Sacramento, but I was originally in the Silicon Valley. We lived very close to Facebook and Google um, and LinkedIn, actually. But But um, how did you go from tech to real estate and then come up with this, this idea? Could you share? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, fun fact, I was living literally across the street from Facebook's campus when I was, uh, when I was at Facebook. Uh, and, you know, during the times I wasn't there, uh, I was doing a lot of traveling, opening up um, offices, recruiting teams. And generally, we stayed in Airbnbs. And uh, a bunch of those Airbnbs were pretty shitty, uh, to be quite honest (laughs) with you. Uh, The design sucked. The host experience was weird. Um, You know, and the whole journey, it was always kind of top of mind. I was like, damn, I want to go stay in another Airbnb. And it's because we're staying in these cities sometimes for a little bit longer than a day or two, right? Um, And you want that local experience. So when we, Sabrina and I, when we started TechFester, we really were starting it for ourselves. We were like, how can we buy our own six, 10, 12 short-term rentals? Because we were traveling all as much as before the pandemic. Um, and you know, we were, we were used to working remotely. So to do that, um, we started building technology. No, <laughs> no surprise, <laughs> to techies building technology to help automate the process of understanding where we wanted to buy, right? We wanted something that was, Great cash flow, great equity growth, good occupancy, good rates, places we wanted to visit. And uh, we built our software. We started as a software company and we shared it with everyone around us. And everyone loved our software uh, to basically help find short-term rental opportunities. No one wanted to do the work themselves. Um, And they were like, look, this sounds great, but I don't really want to do it. But can I give you money and you can go do it yourself, right? And we were like, okay. So we did about six or seven that way for clients. And when we got them all in a room or a virtual room because the pandemic, the Zoom and et cetera, um, they were all like, hey, like, I like yours. I like yours. Can I, I would, wish I had a piece of yours and that one and that one. They were describing a syndication or a fund or a portfolio or something along those lines. And so we pivoted to this portfolio of short-term rentals or a fund for lack of a better word here. And our investors were super excited with that. We announced it about a, a year ago around uh, Halloween of 2021. And in our first month, we raised 7 million and we just went viral and just went with it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So to date, we've raised 20 million, but the idea came from this pain point of understanding um, being the user. And then also coming from tech, we saw so much opportunity, you know, those iPhone 4 camera photos you see on Airbnb or the host that's not really getting back to you or, you know, you walk into a bedroom and you're like, it's a piece of, it's a, it's a mattress. And like, that's it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. And we were like, we could do this better. A lot of low hanging fruit. So we looked into it and, you know, coming from a technical background, we understand the product of Airbnb and the user journey. So we really built a private equity real estate concept backed on the premises of understanding the user journey of a technical product. So while it seems complex, that's where we come from. That was our perspective. 
Got it. So it's interesting. So when I lived in Mountain View, I um, we ran an Airbnb out of our house, became a super host very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, got full paid trip to to Paris for the Airbnb. Um, what is it called? The big shindig that they have every year. The other yeah, super host party. Yeah, the super host yeah. party or whatever. Um and people said this over and over and over again, this place is so nice. And we literally just had a bedroom and a bathroom attached, right? It was like, I decorated, it was my little library. So we kind of decorated it the way that I would like my library. It wasn't really, you know what I mean? It was a guest room, yeah. but it, I was surprised you over and over and over again. We carried an experience. We provided coffee. You know, we did some things that I would want in the morning, um, but nothing really special. And it was interesting to me how people were like, Oh, we'll pay you more, hold the room. Like, well, you know, we want to come every month or whatever. And it just, it w blew up. And I was completely surprised by this whole thing because we didn't really do a lot that was special, right? And so you telling me this experience gives me a little more perspective. Um, I think what was funny is the, the guests would not tell me why you know, they were like, oh, your place is just kind of nicer than everybody else. They didn't want me to raise my rates, I'm sure. Right? <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> they were like, we like these rates. <laughs> yeah, we like these rates, right? Um, but yep. literally, I paid more than our mortgage. We cash flowed one bedroom in the house. This is in the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley with this room that was just kept kind of like a sweet guest room, right? Yep. So it it is interesting what we can do with Airbnb if we just pay a little bit of attention, you know? A hundred percent. And, but however, I think if you go back to that experience, I'd be willing to bet the downsides of what you just described as a host is mm -hmm. the cleans, the guest communications, everything that you have to do to earn that cash flow. It's a job. We can both agree that it's a job. Yeah. It's someone's got to do it, you know, and, and make sure that that guest is having a good time. Cause part of that was the experience. Part of that was the room. Part of that was the pricing. Part of it was everything. Yes. But it was a job. And so TechFester, really what we're doing is we're solving that part. We're saying, hey, if you want to invest in short-term rentals, you want to earn that cash flow, but you don't want to have the headaches or you don't have the time, energy, know-how to do this or the want, but you want the benefit of it, mm -hmm. you can do so passively. And so we're one of the first options to invest in short-term rentals passively for the busy professional. So we'll clean the toilet. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Got it. And, and, and you collect the cash flow. Yeah. I love that because you're right. I mean, it was like, and I, I turned it to where you had to stay at least three nights. I got tired of changing yep. sheets be worth and your time. <laughs> doing sheets, right? That's like, I just, uh, you know, and fortunately most of my guests stayed for about a week. So I was only doing it once a week and it was fantastic, but yes, there was, you know, there was a lot that we did. I would say I probably spent about 10 hours a week doing that, which is not a lot of time considering that it paid for my entire mortgage and cash flow. but yeah. still it was definitely time out of my schedule. Maybe not 10 hours, maybe closer to five, but it was definitely time out of my schedule. And we did other things. Like I enjoyed meeting the guests. So I would take them for a walk around the neighborhood, show them where to go get really good morning coffee rather than just the like <laughs> drip that I was providing at home, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so we did a little bit of that stuff. So that took a little time too, but yes, you're right. It was, I wouldn't say it was a job um, because it didn't take that much time, but it definitely required time. And like during the holidays, I did not want to have people in my house and I did not want to be dealing yep. with this. So yep. I'm, I'm so with you, Steve. And actually that's why I'm having you on this show is because I know that side um, it's what made me stop. And, um, and so I'm really interested in sort of what you're offering. So it's really amazing. So I'm curious. So you gave me a little bit of an idea of why you focused on short-term rentals, but I know you've got some stats onto why that makes more sense. So could you talk to me a little bit more about why you chose short-term rentals, um, and how that works? Yeah. So, you know, I think the first thing for us was our personal motivations of why we got into short-term rentals, right? Like mm -hmm. Sabrina and I were working in tech in the Valley, making these big cushy compensation salaries that everyone kind of jokes about. Um, and, you know, we were both single and living in a, you know, each of us were living, we were sharing a home with people we were working with and making more money hand over fist than we knew what to do with. Um, and it was a privileged position to be in. Um, for sure. And it gave us this opportunity and perspective to think about what, what else can we invest in that's not your typical 401k equities, whatever. Crypto wasn't even really like that hot back mm -hmm. then, right? As much mm -hmm. as it is now. Um, and so 
you know, we started thinking about short-term rentals and we wanted cash flow, right? For us, it was also about breaking away from the nine to five or the at least the feel of being in a nine to five as quickly as possible or having the choice to, right? right. And the time freedom. And so the fastest way to cash flow to us was short-term rentals. It was also the easiest to get into because of the lack of competition, right? So when you combine those things together, you're like, wow, really great margins, little to no competition. I mean, that's like a heaven of any sort of business you're going to enter into, right? Supply and demand is like completely in your favor. Um, and then we looked at our own, you know, experiences of what we could bring to the table. And we were like, this is something that we could really add a lot of value to. But short-term rentals, just from an industry perspective, I mean, you're going to generate, if you're doing it right, two and a half to five times the, you know, the long-term rents of a property. Typically, if you're understanding where to buy, what to buy, and how to best operate. And it's really like a three-pronged approach. And some of that stuff we've built proprietary software around to understand like what to buy and market mapping certain things. And then the operating side is the experience of our fantastic team that I know we're going to talk a little bit about later. Yeah. But you know, having an operating team that understands how to price, how to get, how to communicate with guests, where to build an automations, where not to build an automations, how to make it feel human, how to design, right? How to rank, right? Airbnb is very much like Google, right? If you rank first page of Google guess what? You're going to get clicks, it's right? True. If you rank the hundredth page of Google, you're not going to get clicks as much. Mm -hmm. So how do you rank in it? And therefore by understanding these things, that's why we decided to focus on STRs. It was also such an emerging market. Here's a fun fact. Over 50% of all short-term rentals came online after 2020, right? And so people are starting to recognize that short-term rentals are something that everyone and their mom started wanting to do. I think it predominantly kicked off probably around the pandemic when you look at the data, right? Everyone was like, I want an STR, low interest rates, I can do this. And I think what you're realizing is you start to see these churn of hosts. It's really easy to be an Airbnb owner and an Airbnb host. It's really hard to stay one. Mm -hmm. And that's where people like us who come from a professional perspective, right? Understand what it takes. We have the, we have the operating uh, capabilities to do so the design capabilities, and it's also diversified for us, right? Mm -hmm. So we also wanted something where we could be easily diversified. Instead of owning like three single families in a single area, it's like, how can we own a hundred of them in 10 markets? Because you and I both know Airbnb is seasonal, mm -hmm. right? You have your ups and your downs, right? So we wanted winter months and summer months and fall months and, and all these types of things to allow for really great cash flow throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So what I'm noticing, one of the big reasons that I did not continue with the Airbnb when I moved to the, back to the San Jose area is that the tax rates in San Jose, for instance, with the Airbnb, they suddenly started charging you with all the um, same tax rates that they do with the hotels. Are you noticing mm -hmm. that that's happening across the country or is it, and, and how is that affecting profits for Airbnb owners? Yeah. So, I mean, one, one of the things that I think we we see is in most markets, or I would say 90% plus of the markets, uh, Airbnb is going to collect those, the hotel and occupancy tax that you're talking about right. for you, right, as a host. Now, um, at least today, that cost is typically charged to the guest. And in fact, even in the hotel industry, it's typically charged to Absolutely. the guest. Absolutely. Right. Um, so it's not like an uncommon thing for Airbnb to do. So we're, we don't really see it affecting us at all because it's a common thing. You expect to pay some sort of tax or fee when you're, whether you're booking a hotel or whether you're booking an Airbnb, you're actually booking the same thing. Now, for us, we feel it significantly less because most of our homes are larger homes you know, four or five bedroom homes. We actually don't focus on things like condos or one bedrooms or two bedroom homes. And when you think about the economies of scale that we get or the economics for a family who's traveling, right? I'm a, I'm, I'm a dad of two, right? I can't imagine my wife and I going and staying in a hotel with two kids. She right. can't do it. There's right. no way. Like that would be such a chaotic experience, right? What are you, how are they going to get entertained? Where are they going to go play? Where are they going to go run around? We don't have a kitchen. We have a two week old and an 18 month old. There's wow. certain things that we need. And the e economics of an Airbnb make way more sense when you're a group of four, six, eight, ten, 10, versus if you're traveling alone, you're like, well, I'm going to a conference. Is it for business? Is it for pleasure? I want to stay like in downtown. Like what matters? Amenities matter to bigger groups. And that's what we focus on. So interesting. Yeah. So most of the Airbnbs that I was seeing, especially for instance, in Mountain View, so my competition that I checked out, they might be a four bedroom, but they were little. 
their four bedroom mm-hmm. and they just had kind of like single beds set up, yeah. you know, um, and a shared bathroom type of thing. So I like your idea of more of a luxurious experience, maybe not fully luxury, but a luxurious experience where people are not like, Oh my God, I'm on this bunk bed. This is horrible. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing that we, what we do with our design, I'll have to send you some of our listings after. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll get a sense. Like we have a, like the front of a Volvo car, right. Like that we like cut the front of a, of, of a, of a little Volvo car and like stuck it in one of our living rooms to create like a tiki Volvo bar. Right. Yeah. We have like basketball courts and hot tubs and pools and like iconic Instagrammable moments that you can take photos with your family. Right. Or for yourself, like these are things you're just not going to get in a traditional Air- Airbnb or mm-hmm. you're going to get into a hotel. Right. So we believe we're building the next generation of experiences um, through these amenities and through the, through design, I think you and I can both agree your space matters, Absolutely. right? Like where, you know, your office, where you sleep, you know, where you eat, um, especially if you're relaxing on vacation and you're traveling, your space matters even more. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we really hone into that ethos. And I think we see it in the, you know, we drive higher occupancies, uh, 50, 50% more occupancy than our competitors. Mm-hmm. And we're driving typically almost 40% more revenue than our competitors because we're giving people what they are craving, but they can't find. Right. How would you say your pricing compares to hotels? And how does that, because I will say this, when I was in the Airbnb games, it was early on, right? For us, it was that my pricing was less than the local hotels, right? But I'm hearing more and more in the industry that that's not the case anymore. So how do you price in comparison to local hotels? Do you even consider that? What are your considerations around pricing? So we do look at hotel pricing and other accommodations, um, but nine times out of 10, we're always more economical than hotels. Um, So we're actually cheaper than hotels. And it's because of the type of asset we focus on. So for each market that we enter, we have what's called a buy box, right? And, you know, there are specific types of properties we buy. For example, in a market like Scottsdale, I will never buy something as of right now, right? Based on the price to rent ratio, that's not a four bedroom or higher, right? With a pool. And the reason for that is because at a four bedroom or higher, it makes incredible economic sense. The margins are fantastic. And if it doesn't have a pool, it's a non-starter for me in that market, right? So we know exactly what to buy. So when you think about comparing to a hotel, you know, I just spoke, actually just spoke to a hotel. I'm speaking at a conference in uh, the Midwest in January, and it was six hundred and eighty four dollars per room. We booked two rooms, so it was thirteen hundred dollars uh, for three days mm-hmm. for two people, mm-hmm. right? So gives you some context there. There were those fees that you talked about, right? Now, if we were traveling with a group of eight, would we have booked eight different rooms? Mm. that becomes really expensive at that price point versus just getting a really fantastic Airbnb in that market and being able to all stay together, right? Like walls defeat experiences, right? That's our belief. Like that's a thing. Mm -hmm. If you've ever traveled with your family and you guys have stayed in a hotel, what happens when everyone goes to the room? It's almost like a pause in your trip. It's almost like it interrupts your trip, right? And so for us, we focus on bigger groups. I'm going to say bigger groups, I'm talking about typically six plus, right? And when you're six plus, it's way more economical to do an Airbnb nine times out of 10 with us. You just get more for your money, better location, better amenities, um, easier check-in, privacy, a lot of different things that are going to matter more to you at that point. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me that you choose pools. I do the opposite for liability reasons. Do you want to speak to that a little? Yeah. So, you know, the, the ability to have a pool just drives your ADR significantly. So ADR for those who aren't aware is your average daily rate, which you're able to, whatever you're able to charge on a nightly basis. Um, and we have insurance in place for those types of things. And we have proper, um, you know, gates for kids, for example, and things like that. Um, but to us, the, the risk is well worth the reward. Um, and it's just more about being protected, right? Um, there, there's pools everywhere. You know, I, I don't think we can control what happens at an Airbnb. We're not there. Um, we obviously try to prevent anything that we can, but some things aren't preventable, unfortunately, right? Um, but the liability is a liability and that's a liability for us. That's worth taking on. Got it. So interesting. Do they usually have hot tubs? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, a lot of our properties. In, in fact, in fact, in Scottsdale, it's a priority for us to have hot tubs as an example, Got right? It. So it's like every market, we know exactly what kind of needs to be had in terms of the amenities, how it should be designed. You know, for example, in our clear water market compared to Scottsdale, very different in terms of the amenities, mm -hmm. right? That you'd expect to have. However, both pools, 100%. Other amenities, very different, right? Scottsdale, you're going to, you know, we have, a, we have a baby pink house, uh, right? That's like, you know, bachelor in heaven. We have a, a play on like a Tiffany's home, right? In Scottsdale, uh -huh. you go to clear, you go to clear water and we have a, you know, like sunset homes, right? And mm -hmm. it's more appealing to families. And you got like, we have a room where there's just like all these animals that are like handcrafted on the wall. Why? Because kids are going to more likely stay there than they are in the Scottsdale type market. So these are things, it's really understanding your client and catering to the experience that they're craving. Got it. So a couple more questions. Um, how many markets are you guys in? We're currently in nine. Nine. Okay. So, and we're going to talk ladies in extra about how he chooses those markets specifically. He uses a software. So this is really interesting stuff that he can help provide for you. Right. But we're going to talk deeper um, in extra about that. Um, so actually, why don't you give us kind of a high level of how your software, um, how they can utilize your software, and then we'll do a deep dive in extra. Yeah. So our software really allows us to do a couple of things. And so high level is it under, we market map over 257 different markets and market mapping is just understanding the supply of that market, what comes on market and what's needed in that market. So it's giving us all this raw data. We then take that raw data and map it to the highest performing Airbnbs in that market. And we simply do what we call copy paste, right? What we want to do is we don't, we, we don't believe we're going to reinvent the market. We believe we can operate better, but we don't expect to. So we simply take what's the best possible property we can buy in this market at the specific price to rent ratio. We add the amenities that are required for that property and copy paste it over to ours, right? And then we believe we can operate it better because 95% of the time we're competing against mom and pops who are not using technology or automation, have our design experience, have our capital backing. Therefore, we're able to go in and increase the ceiling of that type of property, therefore deriving the best risk adjusted returns, right? So we're taking what's working and our data tells us what's working. We're taking our operational excellence to improve it. And that's what allows us to create our general alpha above that. Perfect. So one of the things that comes to mind for me is as an Airbnb um, host, <laughs> um, the reason that I was cash flowing on the mortgages in the Bay Area was because I did not hire um, I did not hire a company to handle it all. Of course, I hired cleaning and all of that stuff. But like when I looked at Santa Cruz, there are all these companies that popped up to run the Airbnb for you remotely, but they took such a high percentage. It's kind of like having a management company in California, right? You can't, yep. you don't even break even in a lot of yep. cases. So talk to me a little bit about what kinds of fees you charge and how that translates as far as profitability for owners. Yeah, great, great question. So one of the things that, that we do that's really interesting and predominantly because of that is with high interest rates, high inflation, all these things are going to eat into your operating profits, right? Mm -hmm. And so because we run a portfolio on behalf of our community, um, we actually don't charge an ongoing property management fee. Uh, in fact, what we do is we do what we call property management buy down. We buy down your typical property management rate from industry average down to zero. So like, let me kind of explain what that means. So industry average is 20 to 40% yep. high, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, if you're driving a hundred grand in revenue, you might pay, let's just use 30% here as, as an even number. You're going to pay $30,000 of your gross revenue, your gross, not profit, gross to said property management company. And to be quite honest, it's probably worthwhile for many people because it's a lot of time, energy, and resources to actually get it done correctly. Mm -hmm. Right. So instead, what we do is instead of charging an ongoing fee, we project to hold our properties for about five years, is we collect the property management fee on day one. That's equivalent to a percentage of the property purchase price. And that's it. That's the only fee that we collect. And then that goes towards managing the properties for the next five years. Mm -hmm. And many people would be like, well, why would you do that? First reason is exactly what you just described. If you're optimizing for cash flow, the two biggest things that will impact your cash flow will be your cost of debt, your mortgage, and the cost of management, mm -hmm. right? And so we can't control debt, right? It is what it is, right? It'll go up, it'll go down, but you leverage nine times out of 10 is usually a good thing when it's responsible debt. 
And so one thing we can control is buying down the property management rate as far low as possible, as close to zero as possible. And so by doing that, you're, you increase your upfront cost to do that property. And we can do that because we're running a institutional size fund, right? Um, it allows for increased cash flows over the short term. And it allows us and when we sell to sell based on revenues of higher NOI, right? When you sell something based on a cap rate. So those are some of the reasons why for us, we've chosen this model and everything's a trade-off in business. Everything's a trade-off in investments. So we're choosing cash flow, right? Mm -hmm. We're picking the model that allows us to operate with the highest yield possible because that's what this investment is for, right? If you wanted tax benefits or high equity growth or those types of things, you're going to go invest in some other asset class. But for us, that's what this asset class is good for. Good. So you're basically, so you have to come in with more cash, if you buy down that management, is that true? So it's like 100%. it's like buying down your rate, right? You, I pay one point, exactly. two points, or something like yep. that. So you have to come in with more cash to create the cash flow. Is that true? We're doing that, but we also have the ability to do that because we're vertically integrated and we're you know our our fund is eight figures, right? Mm. So for us, like we have the capital to do so. Um, now, as an investor, right, if you were to work with us and invest with us, you would get the benefits of that, right? That's things that we're able to negotiate and execute at scale. You can't do this very easily, if at all, as an individual owner with a property or two, right? Yes. So this is where that scalable component and in working with an institutionally backed operator like us gives you this flexibility of doing, right? And it works for both sides because that capital goes to funding the property management for those five years, the technology that drives better occupancy and revenue team, right? All those types of things. So it aligns interests on both sides. Got it. So see, if you do not manage properties for other people, your business model is that you don't today. Okay. We and so today. talk to me about your business model. What is it that you do? It sounds like you've got your, your technology. Do you sell the technology to people so that they can utilize it in their own businesses? Talk to me a little bit about how your, your personal business model works. Yeah. So we run a fund, again, for lack of a better word. And in a fund, there's typically a couple of parties, right? There is a general partner, and then there are a lot of limited partners. Um, and then oftentimes, there's things like property management or affiliated companies, right? So we are the general partner. We find, design, furnish, operate the properties, right? And we work with limited partners who give us money, give us capital. And we pull that money together. You know, our minimum check size is about 25 grand. And so we can work with 200 people who give us 25 grand as an example. Mm -hmm. And they put all this money into a pool. We use that pool to buy these properties. We run and operate them. Our investors are gonna get what's called a preferred return. Right, they get the first X percent, six, ten percent, whatever, whatever that rate is going to be that we agree on in our PPM and things that we talk about. Um, and then we, as a general partner, are going to share above that preferred. So we're incentivized to deliver the best possible return. So, like, let me give you an example. Let's say the preferred return is eight percent. So after you get eight percent, the general partner starts sharing in the profits above that. That could be fifty percent, seventy percent, eighty percent of the profits. Right. And so whatever that split looks like, right, is how we generate money as a general partner. And if we're managing the property, we have affiliated business lines, for example, like property management revenue, software revenue, or those other types of things. Right. So those are, that's a, in, a, in a nutshell, generally how our business works. And we're highly incentivized to drive the most profitable returns, A, to incentivize reinvestments to incentivize capital and really solve the pain point of the, the DIYer who's thinking, I want to do this, but I don't want to do all this myself. Right. So, um, so is this more of a fund or more of a syndication? You know, I think they're highly, you know, similar. very similar in many yes. ways, right. Depending on, on the words you want to use here. Um, we syndicate capital in a fund model, right. Okay. For, for lack of a better word. Okay. So do the, um, so the investors, they get the benefit of an interest rate, right? They basically lending you money. You're calling it a preferred yep. rate. Yep. Um, but do they benefit on the back end of this, on the sale or from the, the, um, because you put in a lot of improvements, right? You buy this place and then you, yeah. you add value, right? So the value of that, when you sell it is hopefully going to go up, especially when you start, you prove the numbers of what you're, you know, what, what it's paying you, right? Yep. Um, so do the investors get any benefit of that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So investors share in everything, cash flow, depreciation, which is huge for taxes, right? Uh, we actually pass along 100% of depreciation along to our LPs. Uh, they share in the upside on sale. Uh, when we exit, we have to return all their money back first before mm -hmm. we make any money, right? So all of these things are you know, what we call pro rata. So investors share in every possible revenue stream from that property um, on the cash flow, depreciation, uh, appreciation, cap rate sale, whatever ends up happening, right? With that property, they get their share. Okay. So you've had, you say that most of your terms are about five years. You started this model probably about a year ago. So have you closed any of these out yet and paid out your investors or um, yeah. tell me a little bit about that? So we distribute capital quarterly, right? Or distributions quarterly. Um, and we haven't missed a distribution. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we have we had a, one of our best distributions in one of, one of our best quarters in Q3. So that distribution is coming up here in a couple of weeks. Um, and we've exited eight total assets. Um, of our eight exits, we've delivered about a 42% IRR, right, on the ones that we have exited. Um, so our track record, while it may be young um, to an extent, because we're only about a year old company, um, we've been able to prove the model out with those first eight exits. And the reason we sold those eight early is actually for that reason, right? It's to prove we could buy this asset, which is a single family home, turn it into this other asset of a short-term rental, sell that short-term rental as a business, for lack of a better word, right? Revenue generating business, just mm -hmm. like your one bedroom was, right? Like if you, all your, if your entire home is making 30 grand a month and your alternative is to sell it for 600 grand, you're thinking very differently on what the value is of that home is because it's a revenue generating asset. So we not, we not only did we do that one time, we did it eight different times to prove that we could actually execute and scale that way. And I think that's why our traction has picked up a lot of steam over these last six months. Mm -hmm. Could you explain IRR again? Just yeah. so my ladies uh, know. Of course, IRR is your internal rate of return. It's arguably one of the best metrics to understand your time value of money. So it factors in your returns from cash flow and your returns from sale it does not factor in anything like depreciation um, and IRR way weights capital differently. And so the earlier you reach, you get a return back, AKA earlier cash flow, it weighs that higher in a formulaic algorithm like way rather than if you were to get all your money back in year five. So to give you an example, if you doubled your money in, in five years and you put in 100K on day one and got, on, you know, in month 60, you got 200K, that's about a 14.8% IRR. Now, alternatively, if you were getting 10% a year and then a lump sum in year five, your IRR may be higher because you earned more money earlier. So it waits time as well. So we believe it's one of the best understanding holistically of a return. There's one thing I'm proudest of, it's that we've been able to build an incredible operating team. And I think this is a huge reason why a lot of people have considered investing with us or have invested with us. We have an incredible STR specific team. And what I mean by that is everyone from our head of acquisition, Taylor, to John, who's our head of data, uh, to people on our investor relations team, to myself and Sabrina, to Austin, to Corbin, our head of revenue, head of property, everything. We come from this world. We've dealt with this world. We've scaled portfolios before. Uh, we've scaled infrastructure. Sabrina built AirPods at Apple, took that to a billion dollars in revenue, right? Um, I've built teams from you know 90 people to over 1,100. Uh, John is literally known as the Airbnb data guy. Uh, I've never met a hunter or a sniper from an acquisition perspective in the STR space more capable than Taylor, right? And so these are people who are on our team exclusively. Right. They're the ones who are managing this portfolio to drive this performance. And if there's any one piece of advice that I would share with anyone is if you're investing in a syndication or a fund or you're giving your money to someone else, nine times out of 10, the team matters more than the investment. Mm -hmm. I agree with you team, on that. A good team will be able to navigate choppy waters. A good team will be able to drive better than average performance. A good team will earn whatever their share is in, in their weight of gold easily, right? A bad team can easily drive your investment to the ground very fast. It's not hard to lose money. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to make it, right? And so team and expertise within the domain that you're investing in is really important. You're betting on that team. 
right? And that team or that horse is the one that's going to get you to the finish line. And so that's why we're really awesome to to have the talent. We believe out of any companies in this space um, or any other syndications in this space, we believe we by far have the best operating team in the space. How did you find them? How did you build that team? Well, a little joke with you. So my my role at Facebook was I built teams and, and recruited you know hundreds of people um, over the years, and I slid into all their DMs. Um, and I was like, "Hey Taylor, you know uh, Taylor actually introduced John over to us, um, you know." And I was like, "Hey, I'd love. Here's what we're doing. I love what you're doing. You clearly have the passion for this. I'd love to talk to you about what we're doing, mm-hmm. right?" So we headhunted our team. Um, they, they, they was purposely built the way that it was built. Okay. Um, because, you know, coming from my background at Facebook, what I saw in the five years that I was there, you know, if, I think a lot of people can agree that Facebook is a massively successful company, whatever your perspective is on it. Um, the one thing that was obvious, especially being on the inside, the level of talent that they have was the number one reason that they got to where they could be. Right. And, you know, you look at acquisitions like that they had of Instagram, Right. Instagram, they bought for a billion bucks back in the day. And people were like, wow, that's a lot of money. So I think it was actually one of the first billion dollar acquisitions of an app. And they took that and 30 x it. Why? Because of the talent and the infrastructure that they have. And that's exactly what our ethos is here is by bringing talent together, really great talent in the space. We believe we can 50 x this space because we're all working towards the same goal. Got it. Okay. You know, when you sell, this is a technical problem, a technical question, but when you build um, a business like this, your individual homes, you buy them as single family homes. Is that true? Correct. When you sell them, you sell them as a business, right? Mm -hmm. Do you sell them with a commercial lender or do people buy it with a residential lender? How does that work? I know that's super nitty gritty, but I'm just curious. Yeah, that's great. That's actually a fantastic question. The The short answer is you can technically do either. Okay. Um, it just depends on how much cash you probably want to bring to the table, Got right? It. And who's buying it. But I would say more often than not, you're going to use a commercial product, mm-hmm. uh, often known as a DSCR loan, right? Or a debt service coverage ratio loan. And the reason that one's going to be more ideal is because if that property is a truly successful Airbnb, it'll likely be worth more than a traditional single family home that's based on appraisals and comps, right? Traditional single family is sold based on what the house next door sold for, for lack of a better word, right? Um, And if your property is generating all this revenue, it's going to be worth a multiple of that revenue, right? Not necessarily what the guy next door sold for. So in order to get proper lending on that, it, you're, you're going to need to show financials, right? And we would provide those financials to our buyers, right? In the future, they'd be able to get lending based on the historical performance of this asset and therefore secure lending in a commercial way. And you have to have records for at least two years in order to get any sort of commercial loan on this. Is that true? You don't need to. Um, so for us, all of our properties we buy, we use commercial debt. Yeah. Um, and we use DSCR and it's not an existing short-term rental nine times out of 10. Interesting. So, so there's two ways to do it. You can either underwrite it as a single family home because for us, our ethos is buying it, buying based on value and selling it based on revenue, right? So for us, it's very easy to do. Um, but there's several companies out there today that will actually lend on projected Airbnb revenue, mm-hmm. right? There are tools that they use out there like AirDNA or Rabu or all the rooms or other analytics and APIs, right? Um, Alternatively, you can also buy it the traditional residential way and then turn it into a Airbnb, right? Depending on what kind of income you have, right? If you have a W-2, you might be able to qualify for a residential loan with better terms, right? Commercial lending will have higher higher debt costs, right? It is what it is in the business world. Um, But it's easier to qualify in the commercial world because they're not looking at your income. They're looking at, is this asset a good investment? Right. right. And so it's a lot easier to scale. Right. And so if you're thinking about scale, that's a great option. If you're looking at buying a single property that you're going to house hack or do half of it in Airbnb, you should absolutely consider your options on the W2 side. Right. And, and what those what those rates and programs look like. OK. Oh, such a good answer. Thank you. I feel like we could talk forever because I'm so interested in this topic, but we're running out of time. So <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, um, why don't you tell everybody how they can reach you? 
Yeah. So if anyone's interested in learning a little bit more about TechFester or short-term rentals, uh, we often will hold videos or webinars or other sorts of content. You can follow Taylor on Twitter uh, or on some other social platforms, but you can also talk to us. We're at techfester.com. Uh, you can request to learn a little bit more about what we do and how we do it and if it's a good fit for what you're looking for. Um, or if you're just curious about short-term rentals, right? Like that exact question on debt is actually a question that we get quite a bit because people come to us and they're like, hey, I want to buy turnkey short-term rental, which is another line of our business that we do. Um, and they're like, hey, can you help me find one for myself? Mm -hmm. Right. And the reason I want it is because I want to use it with my family two months out of the year. So can you help me with that? Mm -hmm. Right. So any questions you have, please reach out to us uh, at techfester.com and we're happy to help you out. We're all about education and educating the space. I love that. Thank you so much. And ladies, we are going to talk a little bit more on extra on how to pick your markets for short term rentals. How does Steve do it? How does he specifically use his software to do that and all of that stuff? So stay tuned for that. That's going to be a really great conversation. Um, but before we do that, Steve, are you ready for some three for three rapid fire questions? I'm ready. Hit me. Okay. Tell us how to get started in real estate investing. Give us a super tip. Go for it. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna make mistakes. The very first property I ever did when I was a young kid, I lost thirty thousand dollars in the height of two thousand eight, um, and uh, I stayed away from real estate arguably for the next seven, eight years because I was terrified. Mm -hmm. Don't be me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and then what is one strategy to be successful as a real estate investor? Tell your story. Um, I think stories sell. Um, and oftentimes the person you're selling is yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to sometimes understand your why to why, what you do and why you do it and why you get up every morning to grind the way that you do. Real estate isn't easy. It's a grind, especially in the early years. And so you have to have a why. Okay. I love that. And then what is one daily practice you do see that you think contributes to your personal success? I sit down and talk with my wife. Um, and the reason that's important to me is because I'm a workaholic by trade. And so taking 10, 20 minutes of just dissecting and getting away from everything that is the chaos of Airbnb at times allows me to kind of feel a little bit more grounded in what I'm doing on a daily basis um, and as a father of two, especially two young boys under two, um, it's really important to me to understand my why on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. finding time for them is my biggest motivator. I love that. This has been a great conversation. Thank you for all you've shared, Steve. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me and uh, really, really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And ladies, thank you for joining Steve and I for this portion of the show. It was amazing, wasn't it? I loved it. And if you are interested in more, we've got more. In Extra, we're going to be talking about how does he pick his markets? Why has he picked the mind that he's picked? And what does he look like? Look at, rather. So um, so if you're subscribed to Extra, stay tuned. There's more. If you're not, but would like to be, go to Real Estate Investing for Women Extra. Dot com and you can sign up there. For those of you that are leaving us now, thank you so much for joining us for this portion of the show. I super appreciate you. I look forward to seeing you soon. And until then, remember, goals without action are just dreams. So get out there, take action, and create the life your heart deeply desires. I'll see you soon. Bye. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to find out more about how to become a blissful millionaire, go to blissfulinvestor.com. See you next time.